Okay, so I brought some notes to keep me on track, but I'll try and make this painless. I just need to see, do I need to go this way or this way? There we go, this way. So as Eli said, my name's Patricia. I work for IATS and I'm a partner account manager there, meaning I would work with the folks um, who you guys work with who are software providers. So if you're working with Razor's Edge, um, I might work with BlackBot as a partner. Um, account manager, but we also help nonprofits and come to events like this to see where we can contribute. Okay, so today we're just going to take a 10,000 foot view of PCI compliance. We're going to talk about what are the things you're going to need to consider, what are the practical implications for you, what you should look out for, what kind of questions you should ask, and then at the end, um, the last couple of slides, I have some resources for you. So um, I just want you guys to know if there's any questions you need to ask as we're going through it, just stop me, ask questions, no problem, okay? So now we're going to talk about fraudsters. So who are they? <laughs> Not always easy, this easy to spot, right? This is um, one of the gentlemen who works for us in customer service. It was his Halloween costume. He decided to dress up as credit card fraud. So I just thought I'd throw that in there for you guys. Um, so now we'll go through. So when we're talking about um, fraud for nonprofits, we're not typically talking about someone hacking into a nonprofit's website and stealing their information. We're typically talking about um, someone who is using a nonprofit to steal from someone else, right? So, nonprofits, they're huge targets for fraud. If you think about it, what do you have to do to donate to a nonprofit? You don't have to set up an account, you don't have to buy a product. You go in there, you put your credit card number, you put your name, you put the expiry date, and you're good to go. So nonprofits are considered um, really high risk organizations for payment processors. So some of the hoops that you had to jump through to have IATS as a processor or have other folks as a processor, that's part of the reason why. Okay, so what do nonprofits do? So really, like I said, what they do is they steal credit card information and then they use nonprofits to steal from other people. So basically what a, a fraudster will do is get a whole bunch of stolen credit cards, perhaps buy them on the internet. Um, I think I remember at one of our marketing meetings, our VP said um, one of the um, events that she went to that we go to to make sure that we're PCI compliant, that you could get like you know, 1,500 credit cards for $20 or $30. It was like some ridiculous amount. I'm probably missing there, but, um, but lots. So basically what they do is they get the stolen credit cards, they create a bot, and then they run those cards. So basically that's card number, card number tumbling. So they just run the cards, run the cards, usually making a $1 donation. They can go do it like, you know, three, 400 cards a minute sometimes even faster. They get lots of cards that don't work, and then they get the magic card that does work when they make that $1 donation, and then they take that card, and that's what they use to go and commit fraud to buy their Rolex, or you know, fund their new vacation, or whatever they wanna do. So that's one way they do it, through card and name tumbling. Another thing that fraudsters do is do a thing called the refund scam. So basically what that is is, taking a stolen credit card that they know is going to work and making a donation to a charity. So they'll make a donation for say $5,000. Call up the charity after that and say, hey, I just made a donation to your charity and I meant to donate $500 and I accidentally donated $5,000. I'd like a refund, but I don't want you to refund it. Has this happened to you? <laughs> I, I can see this look on your face that I'm like, oh my God. Um, so they say, um, you know, I, I, I only meant to make a donation for $500. So can you refund that $4,500? Keep the $500, I wanted to make a donation, but I've got a new card now. So please give me a refund on this card. So the charity refunds that $4,500 
on a new card. Fraudster goes away. Now they've got $4,500 on that card. Eventually, the true owner of the original card realizes that a donation has been made. They contact their credit card company. It's charged back to the charity. Now the charity has lost the $500 donation and the $4,500 that they did for the refund scam. Okay, so something really to watch out for. And then lastly, creation of clone charities. So this happens a lot, especially when there's been some kind of humanitarian crisis or a natural disaster in the world. Um, lots of people come out of the woodwork and want to set up clone charities and siphon, basically steal money from people who think they are donating to um, legitimate charities. And they can be um, very shrewd, they have forged documents, maybe forged bank statements, checks, all kinds of information. Um, I think my boss talks about one time where they finally only got to the level, they only caught out that it was um, a scam when they got to the level of looking at who the board of directors of the charity was. And, um, you know, that could be after, they've been talking back and forth with people for like a week, a week and a half, right? And then, boom, the fraudsters disappear. So that's another reason why it might seem like you're going through the Spanish Inquisition when you're trying to get yourself set up with a payment processor, because those are the kind of things that they're trying to look out for. Okay? So I'm just going to change my notes a little bit to make sure that I am on track. So now we're going to talk about how you can stop them. And we have, there's lots of tools. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way and we'll go through them a little bit. And these are the kind of tools, now I'm not saying this to promote IATS, but these are the kind of tools that nonprofits need. Um, PCI tools and anti-fraud tools for for-profits are typically quite different. So one thing that you <coughs> wanna check with your processor, whoever they are, is check out if they have these kind of tools that are specifically for nonprofits. So velocity checking. That's transactions, that bot is processing transactions. Quickly, 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 quickly. So if, if things are coming through, 50 transactions, same IP address, probably the same name, probably the same amount, it's usually fraud. So that's something that can be monitored. Address verification. Address verification is a great tool, but it's a very, very blunt tool. So what will happen with address verification is if on your credit card it's street spelled out and you put ST period, rejected. Um, think about, you know, UK addresses, that kind of thing, right? So address verification is a really good one, but you have to kind of balance the fact that you don't want to shut out legitimate donations. You want to make sure that you let those get through. So it's something that can be used sparingly or, um, trying to think of the right word, with discretion. Um, CVV2 capability. So that's the three-digit number that's on the back of your card. Um, it's always good to enable CVV2 capability to make donors enter that when they're making a donation. I have to let you know, though, fraudsters are already catching up on that. When they're buying stolen credit cards, they're also buying the CVVs that go with it. So, But it is a good thing to enable. Um, then we have IP blocking from high-risk companies. So, uh, did I miss something? No, IP blocking. So, charities can choose, depending on what processor they're using, to have the IP address of um, where the donation is originating um, come along with it. Now, on your credit card, the first four um, digits on your credit card is called the BIN number. And that's kind of like on your social insurance card. It tells where that credit card, the country of origin, maybe the bank, that kind of thing. If you have IP blocking, if you've enabled that the IP comes along and you can see that you have credit cards that um, say that they originated in the United States and you all of a sudden have this flood of credit cards coming through like we did earlier this summer from Brazil, chances are those are going to be fraud. Um, so minimum transaction limit. So Eli just saw this on a donation that he made earlier when he was testing out an Aura form. 
they had set a minimum transaction limit for ten dollars. Because I think you started, you were gonna test it out with one dollar, right? I was gonna do five. I'm not. Oh, bad sorry. Too. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. But fraudsters will typically go one dollar, right? So you want to set a minimum transaction, and you want to make it realistic for your nonprofit or charity, right? So if um, you know you're typically getting twenty, thirty dollar donations, maybe you want to make it fifteen dollars. If you have the kind of donations that people are donating a hundred dollars. Maybe you want to go up a little bit more. So you don't want to act, it's, it's always keeping in balance. You don't want to um, block legitimate donors, but you want to try and catch as much fraud as possible. And then last but not least, the kind of payment form that you're using. So um, if anyone here is using one of our products, which is called the Aura, the Aura form, it's an iframe. So basically what that means is it's opening in your donor's browser but the form is on our server. So it looks like it's on your server, but it's on our server. So no credit card data is ever touching your server. So that's a good way to, um, to keep the charity from um, coming into PCI scope. Does that make sense? Yeah, so is that basically like a YouTube video where you get that little piece of code, you drop it in, and then you just play the video on your site? That's, yeah, that's how the Aura form works. It is a little piece of JavaScript. But I mean, I think the important thing to remember is it's not hosted on your server. Nonprofits, you do not want any, as much as possible, you don't want credit card or banking data to get your servers, okay? You'll see a little bit later when we get into it about you know, where you are in PCI, that'll put you in scope. And then direct post, that's where it kind of has an interaction with your servers, but you're posting it directly to us or another processor, I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't know if you're going to address it later, but um, that just made me think of Visa for a second. Um, the Privacy Information Act. Mm -hmm. So, if the Aura uh, window is on our website and people are inputting personal information on it, um, is, is our organization um, still liable by extension for the personal information that you are collecting? Or is the liability entirely? Um, well, if you, and, and I am going to address this a little bit, I, I don't know so much around the privacy part of it, so the privacy of information, and the PCI side of things, if you have a merchant account, you're in scope for PCI. You could have, you'll see, you could have everything in your organization outsourced, but you're still in scope for PCI. Privacy, I'm not too sure, but I can follow up with you after this and um, give you my card. You can send me an email and I can certainly answer that question for you. So, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. So, this is just, whoops, how did I do that, Eli? I just made a... Uh, I couldn't tell you. I don't know how I did that either. I repressed though. Um, Thanks. <laughs> I don't care if it stays on that slide. <laughs> I haven't the fog yet. I don't a, know what a, I've done to it. Not a Mac user. That's okay. We can just leave it. I mean, it's, it'll probably go everything's going to be beautiful. Hooray! Perfect. Yeah. So again, this is just showing. Um, this is our back office portal. So depending what payment processor you use, it might look a little bit different. But these are the fraud tools that you can set. So you can see that you can enable name tumbling, card tumbling. You can have a bin check against the IP address, velocity check, all that kind of stuff. Select the countries that you're going to do it for. So um, we can help people with that. Our customer care department can certainly help with that. We certainly watch out for things like that. But nonprofits can empower themselves and use these fraud tools. Okay, so this is just a really quick case study of a particular nonprofit, and what I'm going to point out to you here is that all of the green ones are approved transactions and all of the blue ones are rejected transactions. So keep in mind, rejected transactions, you're not paying any processing fees like as a percentage, but you are paying an authorization fee. So every single one of these rejects is costing the nonprofit. It's costing them that authorization or transaction fee. 
So what? So this is, I think, over the course of a few months. So they obviously were getting a lot of fraud. It's not usual to get that many bank rejects. So you can see it peaked here. Then they applied fraud tools, and you can see that the bank rejects went down dramatically, and the fraud rejects went up. And you're not going to get a charge when, when all these new fraud tools are starting. You can see then that they came, they tried for a while, they went, eh, it's not working. They went away for a little bit, they came back, they tried, and again and again, right? So you're pretty smart. They'll come and try, and then they'll leave it alone for a while, they'll go to somebody else's, and then they'll come back. Some nonprofits, especially big ones, we have one client, um, they get fraud attacks probably 40, 50 times a day that are like huge you know, bots trying to attack their website, trying to do donations. So that's just an illustration. And we do monitor for that thing. If we're seeing a lot of bank rejects, we'll go in and look and we'll see where those transactions are coming from and then we'll work with the nonprofit to make sure that those are left after. All right, so now we're gonna get into what it, the heck PCI is. So PCI is a standard that's set by the payment card industry. So basically Visa, MasterCard, Amex, but really it's just Visa, um, the, main, the main people that you're going to hear me talk about. And all merchants, meaning all charities that have a merchant account that money is deposited into, are in scope for PCI. PCI talks about how you can properly store credit cards, how the data is transmitted, how it's processed. But it's more than just that. It's more than just your, your systems. It's about the processes that you implement within your organization too. So we'll go over that a little bit more. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how PCI actually helps you. So what PCI does, it can seem kind of intimidating, but once you get into it, you can see it basically lets you know <clears throat> what you need to do. Sets a framework for how you can make sure that your organization is protecting your donor's data, getting legitimate donations, and kind of helps you sleep at night. It'll, it'll help you figure out what you need to do around your systems and what you need to do around your processes in your organization. Okay, so what do you need to do? So first of all, you need to figure out what your level of compliance has to be. So I have a slide that's coming up next where we're gonna have a look at and see what level of compliance people are at. And then depending on your level of compliance, you're gonna um, complete either a self-assessment questionnaire, and there's different levels of self-assessment questionnaires, or if you're unlucky or, or a big organization like us or a payment processor, you're gonna to have to do a report on compliance. Okay, so different types, all of these self-assessment questionnaires depend on the different types of systems you're using, the different types of processes, um, what kind of credit card processing you're doing, whether you're using a point of sale system, whether it's all online, all that kind of stuff um, comes into account when you're seeing what level you're at. Okay, so I'm just going to tell you just a couple of examples of um, ways that processes affect people's PCI compliance, not just systems. So does anybody here know what caging is when people do caging? Okay, so a caging system would be when someone sends out donation cards in the mail and donors either complete that donation card with their credit card information or send a check and mail it back. So typically it would go back to someone or an organization that does caging. They take that information and they're going to be the ones that enter that credit card information. Oh, so like those little boxes, box, box, boxes, is that what that's referring to? Yeah, um, yeah like, like if you got, um, the example I'm thinking of is um, Canadian Cancer Society or BC Cancer. So they typically do their annual giving and you'll get a little card in the mail and I'd like to donate or United Way, right? So really what you're doing is you're putting your credit card number down on a piece of paper and you're putting it in the mail, mailing it to someone, okay? 
So what cagers need to follow is they need to have a secure way to get that information, store that information, who's going to process that information, and then what's going to happen to that card after they do that. So for caging, it's really quite a bit around processes rather than systems. So for organizations like you guys or organizations that are only um, accepting donations online, imagine you go out and you have an event. Um, I'm going to make a real silly one. You're having a bake sale, right? So you're selling cupcakes to people on the street and someone is writing down credit card numbers on a piece of paper and then sticking them in their pocket and going back, sorry, there's a fly here, and going back to their office and then entering credit card information. That would not be PCI compliant unless you have processes in place to make it PCI compliant. So um, that person's pocket, that's only where the information goes. They're the only people that write it down. I mean, it's kind of a silly example, but it's just to illustrate, it really is around processes. Okay, so here's where we're going to talk about the compliance levels. So the next couple slides might be a bit of an eye chart, but I'll just walk you through them. So level one, that's going to be folks like us. Anybody who's doing over 6 million visa transactions per year, no matter how you're doing them, online, doesn't matter. You have to be PCI compliant level one. And that can be... Um, pretty involved task. I'll go into it a little bit more. I have a slide that shows what we have to do to be PCI level one. Most people here, I think, are going to fall into three or four. So you're going to be processing um, 20,000 to a million visa e-commerce transactions a year. Or if you're processing under 20,000, um, then uh, all other merchants, regardless of acceptance, up to one million, you're going to be level four. So does anybody see themselves here in three or four? Anybody, any twos? It would be great if you were doing one million to two, six million transactions per year. I think we're probably here, right? Okay. So I have a question. Uh, yeah. Visa transaction, what are the pieces? Any credit card? Right. Yeah. It's, it really is any credit card. Um, PCI is kind of led by Visa, but it really is the payment card industry. So, okay. So, after you see your level of compliance, then you're going to go through and you're going to see what kind of SAG you need to do. So, SAG is a security assessment questionnaire. So, most people here hopefully are going to fall into A and AEP. So, A obviously, card not present, so that's online and you've outsourced all of your cardholder data functions. So you've outsourced, you're not doing the processing on your server, someone else is doing the payment processing, that kind of thing, you're gonna fall into A. A is probably the easiest and the best one to be in. And then EP is a little bit more difficult than A, and you have a website, it doesn't directly receive the cardholder data, but it can impact the security of the transaction. So you'll see when I go to the next slide, folks who are A um, might have the iframe solution so that everything on their donation form is on someone else's server. It's not affecting their website. Whereas folks who are AEP might be using something else for a donation form that does have some impact on their website. So they might fall into AEP. Um, no one here, I don't think, is going to be anything in between here. And then if you're not those, you're going to be D. Okay? We want to try and avoid having people be D. When you're D, it's a little bit more onerous. It's not the same as being us, like level one, where you have to have, you know, huge audits. But you do have to have your um, server scanned. Okay? So, whoops, going the wrong way. So now we can see where are you. So here we've got the merchant levels on this side. We've already kind of figured out that most of us are probably in three or four. And then going through this way, we're talking about how you're accepting stuff online. So redirect. Someone hits donation, 
donate, they fill in all the information, they hit donate, the URL changes, and they go to Canada Helps. That's really direct. So you've outsourced your donation processing. So you're going to be SAQA for both three and four. That's right on. Very, very good. Same thing for iframe. They're on that donation page, but it's not on your server. It's on our server. So again, you get to be SAQA. Direct post, JavaScript, all of that stuff, it does affect your server. So you're going to have to do SAQA EP and then the dreaded SAQD where you would have to have your server scanned. Okay? So always going to try and stay out of SAQD as much as you can. Okay, so what can you do? So obviously everybody wants to maintain and um, first of all find out how they can achieve PCI compliance and then maintain it. One thing you can do is talk to your processor. What tools do they have available? How can they help you? What can you implement? But as we talked about before, it's really all around processes too. So you need to train your staff. What are they going to watch out for? The refund scam. How are they going to do refunds? How are they going to watch people's accounts? What kind of processes do you have? Um, you'll see when we go to a later slide. For us, we have to have processes for even who's in control of the front door. Stuff like that. So it's really just, um, most of it's common sense, but it just really needs to be thought about, written down, have people understand why they're doing it. Okay, so your basic strategy to keep with the SAQA, which is the best, outsource as much as possible to someone else. So don't have stuff hitting your server, don't be using your server. That way, you can only um, you can make sure that you only have to do SAQA and SAQEP. And when you're going through these, make sure you understand the questions that they're asking you. It basically it's a self-assessment questionnaire that basically walks you through understanding what you're going to need for PCI compliance. Okay, any questions so far? I'm whipping through this pretty fast. If your server is scanned, so it's basically coming in. Um, so for us, you'll see. Actually, I'll just um, I'll just go to the next slide, and um, then when, when we get to our slide where I show you what I have to do, I'll explain that to you then. Okay. So don't let worrying about PCI take over your life. It's really really manageable, especially if it's the SAQA, but don't totally avoid it. Because, as I said before, some of the policies, they're just a good idea for how your staff works anyway. And also, make sure that you're not sacrificing your user experience. It's one thing to be PCI compliant, but if you make it so hard for your users that you can't get any donations at all, what's the point, right? So, don't use um, platforms that your users aren't going to like, things that aren't going to work for you. There's always going to be a balance. Okay, so this is us. So basically scanning um, our servers would be making sure that um, they're checking our servers for things like malware, um, that we're using the right security, um, uh, security <coughs> certificate level, all kinds of stuff like that. So just making sure that our servers are secure and PCI compliant. Um, they come into our office and probably stay for about a week. And during that week when they're there, they're checking everything. They're doing random checks on files. They're doing random checks on, again, because it's not just about the system's processes, who sees what information, where that information is stored, all the way down to, like I said, who can access the office. Log, making sure every action that we do is logged on the server using our API. So that's one of the things that folks have to go through. One of the things I'll let you know though is it, it's quite expensive to um, get your report on compliance done. You have to have a professional do it and they have to do what's called an attestation of compliance. So that's a good thing to ask for anybody that you're working with 
if they're PCI compliant and they, if they have an attestation of compliance. But because it's so expensive just to get that attestation, lots of vendors, whether they're software vendors, I wouldn't go so much with processors for this, but software vendors, they might go through all of these steps and be PCI compliant, but not get that final attestation of compliance. So they're okay to work with as long as you know the right questions to ask to make sure that you're working with someone who's PCI compliant, they might not necessarily have that certificate. Right. Well, they've gone through it, they just haven't got the external verification. Exactly. Because it can cost quite a bit of money to do that. Yeah? Just to map out all the categories in my head, where would businesses like Eventbrite and the RSVP, RSVP book fit um, in this? Are they shouldering all the PCI compliance so that other organizations don't have to be? Or does that, does that shift? PCI compliance? Um, it, it shifts the scope in which you're in, right? So we talk about how, how far you are in scope. So someone like us, a processor, we're in full scope of PCI compliance. Every single thing we do, that's why we have to have the audit, we have to be level one, not just the amount of transactions too, right? But we're totally in scope. When you're outsourcing to folks who are PCI compliant, and that's one of the things that you're going to see in the questionnaire, they're going to ask you about your systems and who you're working with. So when you're outsourcing to folks who are PCI compliant, it takes you out of scope, but no matter what, you still are within scope for PCI compliance if you're using a merchant account, so even still, if it's outsourced. So you still fill in these questionnaires? And, yeah. Okay. So you would probably be, let's see if I go back. Right? So if you're under 20,000 and you're doing a redirect like Canada Helps, that would be outsourcing your processing rather than, I don't know, something someone made on your server and you're actually storing your credit card information. So you're only going to have to do the security assessment questionnaire A, which is a bit of a toggle compared to what you have to do for SAQB. So you always want to work as hard as you can to make sure that you stay at these three levels. So you say basically make it someone else's problem. Yeah, so, but don't forget, even if you outsource everything, you're still within scope because it's not just about your systems, it's about your processes, okay? So, all right, so the key takeaway is I'm almost done. You can own the, pro you must own the process and you can. It doesn't have to be intimidating. Um, I have a really good resource, a link for you to look at later that, because um, I know people kind of have a copy of this, that has um, kind of bite-sized documents, two or three pages. It's the PCI website. If you go directly to the PCI website, you're just going to lose your mind and go, why the hell did I even go here? Because there's so much stuff, right? It's going to seem so overwhelming. But if you use this link, it's going to take you to the place where you can read little bite-sized documents, figure out where you need to be, and get your self-assessment questionnaire. So as we mentioned, it encourages um, useful habits. You're going to create a sustainable culture, and that's by making sure that your processes are PCI compliant, making sure everyone in your organization understands why it's important to be PCI compliant, why you make them follow that process, and then um, you don't need to sacrifice your user experience to do it. So, here's some resources from IATS. So, you can just go on our website and have a look. We have a white paper, we have an infographic, which is this. This is where the bad guys are going to come from. And um, credit card fraud, too. Okay? And general resources. So, Drupal. Um, Probably some people here know what Drupal is, right? Drupal, a way to build websites. What does that have to do with PCI compliance and what we're talking about? They have some really good resources. So I would encourage that. And then this is the link that I'm talking about where you can get to the actual documents so you won't be pulling your hair off when you go to the PCI website. Cool, yeah, we'll share these slides and links afterwards by email so you don't worry too much about yeah. writing it all out. Yeah. And that's it.
that is the end. Any questions? Yes, yes. Oh my gosh. So I'm not saying I've ever done this, but my understanding from this is that I should no longer create Google Forms asking for people's credit card information so that I can then process it in my terminal that I've got next and, to my desk. And save it on your laptop? No problem. So you not. shouldn't do that. Okay. Or if you are doing that, if you have a process in place that makes that PCI compliant, so you've outlined who can do that, who can see it, how that information is going to be secured, how that information is going to be destroyed after it's used, right. then you could be PCI and compliant. Google has that. a little warning on that form saying, like, don't put financial information here, but I may have to ignore it. Um, yeah. As part of PCI compliance at our organization, we have to block so much stuff on our server. I can't even look at Google Docs. If somebody sends me a Google Doc, I have to email them and go, I can't look at that. You need to send it some other way for me to do that. I can't access Gmail. Um, we scan our servers constantly. Just as a little anecdote, um, I was doing my expenses about three weeks ago, and I downloaded my credit card statement, and uh, I downloaded into a CSV form, and I blocked out everything except for my name and the transactions that I wanted them to see on my expense account, I went to email it to my boss and instantly it came up on our server that I had, I can't even remember the exact words, but it was kind of scary, right? It was like, what are you doing sending credit card information? And then I had to go and talk to the COO and let them know and show them what I had sent, right? So that's the level that we have to go to and that's the kind of processes that we have to follow, that we're not allowed to send credit card data by email through CSV, even if you can't read any of the information. More questions? How does it scale into an organization? Like, where do you guys start? For, if you're going to start working with a nonprofit, from a price point? Um, like, you guys do, is your pricing structure based on number of transactions or? Oh, to, to actually process with IATS, we have flat rates. Okay. So, typically, um, for smaller nonprofits, um, so there's different ways that people might offer you rates, right? There might be flat rates, there might be something called Interchange Plus. Anybody familiar with Interchange Plus? So Interchange Plus means that you're going to pay a different rate depending on what type of card you use. So I don't mean what type of card, meaning Visa or MasterCard, though that could be the case. I mean what kind of Visa card. Do you have a regular Visa card? Do you have a Visa Air Miles card? Do you have a Visa gift card? All of those are going to get charged a different transaction rate. And that transaction rate is set by the card companies and the issuing banks. Okay? So for most non nonprofits, especially small ones, if you're processing under a million dollars a year, interchange plus rates don't make sense. It's going to be pretty expensive for you, and it's not going to be transparent to you what you're actually paying. It's going to be hard for you to keep track of what you're paying. So typically for nonprofits, we offer flat rates. Um, for Canadian nonprofits, we also have a special rate if you're registered with the Canadian Revenue Association. So it's a lower rate. So that's quite nice for Visa and MasterCard. Um, one thing that I would tell everyone to take into account is what kind of processor they're using. If so meaning are they an aggregator or not? So do you have your own merchant account or are they aggregating all of the transactions into one merchant account? So for instance, PayPal. PayPal would be an aggregator. So you can, you've noted, if you've signed up for a PayPal account to accept um, donations, it's super easy, right? You can get a PayPal account in like one, two days. And it's because they're taking on the risk. It's their merchant account and everybody's transaction is going into that merchant account, that's also why it takes so long to get paid. <laughs> because it goes into that merchant account, they sort everything out, and then they pay it. When you work with folks who aren't aggregators, like IATS, you have your own merchant account, so all of the funds go directly into your merchant account. Another thing, oh sorry Eli. So one of the questions I've got is, so often what I've encountered is sometimes people get very confused about the payment, like they're on their statement, they're like, oh, this payment came from Front Street slash 
A, B, X, Y, as opposed to the actual charity name, is that merchant account how, like, sort of what would actually be on people's statement as opposed to having it say PayPal? Yeah, it, it can be. When you're working with an aggregator, it can be that um, it's not going to be your organization's name that, that um, appears on people's credit card statement. If you have your own merchant account, if you're working with your own merchant account, if you're working with a processor that does that, it's going to be your charity that does. Um, when you're looking at rates too, the thing to keep in mind is what comes along with that rate. Are you going to have to pay extra to get your account set up? Are you going to have to pay extra to get your statement? Are you going to have to pay extra to use fraud tools? Are you going to have to pay extra to be able to accept recurring transactions? All those kind of things. Um, organizations like Canada Helps, um, they are also an aggregator, I believe. I think they pay people, I think, once a month. They're pretty secure because it's redirect, right? So somebody hits donate and it redirects for that URL. But that would also be something that I would look into as whether that affects the user experience. There have been studies that suggest that probably 30-40% of people drop off from making a donation when the URL changes. Because all of a sudden they're like, ah, where am I now? I'm not on the charity's website. I'm off of here. Especially older people, right? Like we probably all would be okay, but you know, it's your grandma and grandpa, right? So yeah. Pardon me? Uh, no, it's not a law. It's an industry standard, but there can be consequences because you can be fined, right? So if we're not within PCI compliance and we have some kind of data breach or something like that, we can get fined big time by Visa, MasterCard, one of the card providers, and then they can make it more difficult to be able to operate as a processor or <coughs> make it more stringent for what you have to um, uh, be able to complete to achieve compliance. Well, we do not, so charities that work with us, we don't monitor charities' PCI compliance. Charities that we work with in the United States, they actually, we do actually charge them a PCI compliance fee. And what that basically does is enroll them in a program so they can become PCI compliant. Once they become PCI compliant and give us that certification, we don't charge them that fee anymore because it really is just to enroll them in that, in that um, program. So we don't require that you're PCI compliant. We try and help you get PCI compliant and maintain it, but really it's the responsibility of the individual nonprofits and the individual organizations. So audits is Vancouver based. Are your servers physically in Canada? Nope. Actually, our servers are in the United States. So IATS is a local British Columbia organization that's owned by a bank in the United States that is owned by the Ontario <laughs> Teachers Pension Fund. <laughs> so we're a Canadian company that's owned by an American company that's owned by a Canadian organization. So it all goes back. Most payment processors are owned by banks, right? Most payment processors, if you look down at the bottom, right, you'll see it says an ISO of Wells Fargo or an ISO of this or an ISO of that. So most organizations are owned by banks. Um, there's often comes up questions about um, people's data going outside of the country. That especially comes up for associations. So right now I'm working with an association that's a government employee association. So of course they have questions about where our servers are. Um, we're required to comply with Canadian privacy laws, all that kind of thing. So it's not typically a huge issue. I mean, if you think about it, look at the BC government, right? All of our healthcare information is outsourced to an American company. Mainly, I think people are concerned because then that information might fall under the um, umbrella of the Patriot Act, but it's kind of the cost of doing business in the United States. Yeah. I have a question. 
question. Has anyone here ever like done an actual training within their organizations around around these kinds of best practices around PCI? So I'm just thinking about all the times when I've been a nonprofit, like around events, where I'm like, I'm collecting people's credit cards on the phone, someone walks in, I write things down, it's like all those non-digital interactions I have, I never really thought about like, what is our policy with this, and when, when are things destroyed, and like, just, I've never really put my brain around what was the yeah, process, and did we all agree about it before we just dealt with the crisis of people where they're registering for events, like, Throw in digital, like, sorry, credit card info at us. Has anyone gone through that stuff internally within their own organization? <laughs> <laughs> My organizations are, have always been FIFA compliant, we're pretty good about that. Yeah. But this organization that I'm working with uh, is kind of double edged. We're FIFA compliant because with a love degree of technology and information we're gathering, it's so easy to be FIFA compliant. Um, that we really do need to get complicated. <laughs> so we have not previously ever needed to be uh, PCI compliant. When we have been working with credit cards, we've outsourced that to um, businesses like Eventbrite or RSN Yeah. Right. So one, one thing that will help you around those processes is going ahead and looking at those documents and doing that self-assessment questionnaire. Because like I said, the self-assessment questionnaire is going to guide you through questions, not just about your systems, but about your processes. So it is really helpful. Sorry, you were going to ask? Yeah, I was going to say, like, how would you compare the two types of charging between flat rates and also the types of sure. rates? Like, you guys are on flat rate, it sounds great for a nonprofit, but what do those flat rates say? Oh, sure. You want to know the actual yeah, like rate? Actual, like what, sure. What um, let me see if I can remember off the top of my head. I'm so used to quoting the American rates, not the Canadian rates. I apologize. Um, so for um, nonprofits that are CRA registered, Visa and MasterCard, so these I know for sure, yeah. but the rest don't quote me on. Um, it's 2.05% for Visa and MasterCard. Um, the authorization fee is 35 cents and then it's a $16 monthly fee and I believe Amex is, Amex is always the outlier, right? It's always super expensive compared to other things. It's I think 3.6%. So with that, again, you also have to look at what comes with that, right? What you get free. So fraud tools recurring payments, stuff like, um, so ACH. So does anybody process ACH, direct debit? Anyone except direct debit? You guys should be doing it. It is really, really good. One thing, people don't change their bank account information no as often. Dates. Sorry? No expiry dates. Yeah, no expiry <laughs> dates. They don't change their bank account information. Um, it's cheaper to process, so you're gonna save money. The, the rate to process ACH in Canada, the percentage transaction, 1.75%. And I think it's 26 cents. No monthly fee if you're already processing credit card, so you can just kind of add it on there. It's easy to add to your form, especially if you're using an order form. All you have to do is enable it in your form. You want to get going with recurring donations using that, right? and then people are entering their bank account information every month or every week or every year, depending on what they've set for that, that's gonna be pulled out of their bank account, it's gonna come into you. ACH is especially good, younger people like using ACH. So it's ACH in Canada or direct debit. You can also accept it for the United States and if you're an international organization, we also do it for the UK and the Eurozone. So, if you want to expand your reach, you can also do that with international currencies. So another thing that made me think of ACH is when you're processing recurring transactions, um, another service that we offer is called um, Card Pass Due Program. So if we set your transactions, and I'm sorry, I don't want this to turn into like a sales thing for IATS, but you asked me about the rates, so I just want to tell you what comes with it because it's, it's the kind of questions that you, when you're comparing processors, ask them these kind of questions, right? Because lots of times you go on this site and 
first of all, we don't even put our rates on our site. We talk to people about them, right? Mainly because when you go to people's sites, you see their rates, but then it's got the little dot. And it's extra for recurring or it's extra for fraud tools, that kind of thing. So to go back to what I was saying, the card pass do, we can flag those kind of things. So most, but not all, banks will ignore the expiry date. So your recurring transactions will still keep processing. If it stops, then you can use another service that we have, which is the account updater. So you take all of those credit card numbers, you get them in the back office portal and take them, send them to us in a file. We send them away, we get all that information updated and send that back to you. Why is no one else accepting you do that? Um, I think people in the States do that, but I think we're the only ones in Canada that do it. It's, it, yeah, you know, when I was at the Suzuki Foundation, that's why we stayed with you because that was so important to not lose, you know, a third of our people every couple of years and it's like we didn't quite get the renewal process. Well, and also thinking about having to phone all of these those people and use those resources that maybe you want to be using for your mission to get your credit card information updated. And is that only so. for updated expiry dates, or are you No, update the credit card information. Yeah. See? See, nobody knows about this. Like, it, it blew my mind when I first heard about it. Just like, I'm like, is that legal? Are you allowed to do that? We can spend two days. <laughs> and every time you call them, you've got another chance for them really? to say, like, oh, I don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. Another thing that um, I would really, really suggest that people talk to not only their processors about, but any kind of software platform that you're using, who owns that data? Okay? If you're processing with us, you own your data. So if you want to move from another processor, uh, move to another processor for, from us, we're going to help you transfer the data from us to that other processor in a PCI compliant manner. Okay? So, you, so those data stores are like the little tokens for the monthly yep. transactions, you can yep. actually get those out? Yep. So if you have recurring transactions, we can move, we can help you move that information over to your new processor. I was just talking to someone today actually on the phone who's using Luminate Online, and um, they can't get their recurring transactions yeah. out. What if Blackbox will not do that for you? No, and that's even, that's their software. That's not even their processor, right? There's processors that um, feel that the data belongs to them, so they'll give it to you, but they'll charge you for it, or they'll charge you to get it. We don't charge people to get their information from us, their data, and we also don't charge to have your data so, something else to ask too.